There has been a lot of debate lately on whether or not the United States of America is a corporation. One camp suggests that within the U.S. Code and law, it explicitly says the United States of America means a corporation. The other camp, after doing much research on the topic, tends to use Wikipedia and online dictionary references as to what a corporation is and how it differs from a nation or state. To understand what a corporation is and how the United States is one, we will look at how it is defined and the history that surrounds it in America. The definition of a corporation is a company or group of people authorized to act as a single entity, legally a person, and recognized as such in color of law. So according to current dictionary definitions, Mitt Romney was not that far off. The definition goes on to say, a group of people elected to govern a city, town, or borough. Have you ever entered a town and read a sign on the side of the road saying, now entering corporate limits? To incorporate means to become a part of something much bigger. There are two forms of law that govern the world. Common law of the land and color of law admiralty of the water. Both are used, but color of law takes precedence since almost all law is written to administer commerce. The following is a short explanation of admiralty law to better help you understand from a Yale law book. In 1768, John Adams prepared for the citizens of Boston instructions to the representatives in which it was said, that next to the revenue itself, the late extensions of the jurisdiction of the Admiralty are our greatest grievance. The American courts of Admiralty seem to be forming, by degrees, into a system that is to overrun our Constitution and to deprive us of our best inheritance, the laws of the land. The powers of the Admiralty and the Vice Admiralty courts are extended beyond their ancient limits whereby our property is taken from us without our consent. Initially, when America was colonized by the Anglo-Saxon English, each colony was set up in contract with the king and his corporations through charters to set up farming plantations for the debt slaves to work off their debt to the king and his corporations. These corporations were overseen by the bosses of these corporations to ensure the king was to make a profitable investment and grow his grand corporation. The governors were selected by the king to oversee the corporate structure of each area to be colonized in America. These governors were to ensure the king was represented and taxes were collected for the king for the commerce occurring in the new founded colonies. Each governor had to answer a councilman back in England for all laws, ordinances, and taxes that were decided by a group of 13 men in England. During this time, it took months and sometimes years until laws and rules were implemented in the corporate structure of America. They sought through many charters a way to more efficiently collect taxes, implement law, and govern the people. The best way to look at this was each governor oversaw the creation and operation of plantations within their colonies to take the land and make it more productive and profitable for the crown corporations headquartered in England. These plantations were mostly known as townships. As more people moved to work on these plantations, local plantations were incorporated into counties. These counties and their commissioners were charged with the responsibility of taking real estate and making smaller, more productive plantations. The plantation counties were essentially broken up into smaller plantations called townships again. Township is a very interesting word when you break it down into its roots. How can a town be considered a ship on dry land? This is where admiralty law can first be seen to come in effect in the colonies that reflects today's current laws. From the initial founding of the colonies, the plantations and corporations overseeing the plantation's production was protected under martial law admiralty code. The king's army and navy ensured all law would be upheld and contracts would be followed by having agents to represent the king and his interest at all contract disputes. 
All land was owned by the king. It was chartered to corporations, and people worked for these corporations, where in some states it was then chartered to them in Old English Common Law Real Estate. They were tenants of the land that they lived on. But unlike today's deeds, the deeds of this time did not state explicitly that the landowners were tenants to the king in a serfdom, feudalism manner. But they were, and that's very much correct. Our colonies were set up in a feudalistic manner and continued to function in this form of real estate today. As the corporations begged for the governance of England to be more efficient, to become more profitable, the king contracted many individual charters with the colonies, allowing them to set up corporate admiralty assemblies. These assemblies, comprised of men who lived and profited from the plantations rather than someone overseas whose life was not affected by what was going on in America. The people charged with the responsibilities of the plantations benefited when they were profitable and sought for a better way to become more powerful over their plantations and the people living and working on them. And so a company was granted a royal charter by Queen Elizabeth in the year 1600 to oversee all the plantations in America. This corporation was known as the East India Company, trading mainly in cotton, silk, indica dye, salt, salt petri, tea, and opium. There is no mistake that the flag of the East India Company and the Star Spangled Banner resemble each other so much. Toward the latter half of the 18th century, those who gained power and wealth through this corporation wanted unity and more power and wealth, as always occurs with corporations. They grow, and they can only survive if they continue to grow. The revolution was nothing more than a battle of power between the rich and powerful king and the CEOs of plantation corporations on American soil. This was the very beginning of the independence of America. It was where the rich overseers of plantations sought to institute a control over the people in America by taking power from the king. They wanted the power to tax the people. It is taught in history that we revolted as a people against the king to ensure liberty and freedom because we yearn to be free. After years and years of research, I have found this to be nothing more than a myth, and all factual evidence proves otherwise. It was how every war in history was played out. Poor men fighting rich man's wars to make rich men rich. The Stamp Act was one of the last straws for Americans as a whole. But the rich elite of America, it was the last straw because they wanted the power to tax and control the populace. They were jealous of the king's powers over the people and they wanted it for themselves. So as the revolutionary battle subsided, the rich corporate power elites of America came together to propose a charter written by them rather than the king. And so they agreed upon a bankruptcy charter to pay back for the cost of the revolt and institute a new governing body over the people without restraint from the king. This bankruptcy charter was presented to the king by Benjamin Franklin, and the king accepted the terms of the bankruptcy and the reorganization of the corporate plantations into a bigger corporation with better safeguards and protections for the profitability of the plantations. This first corporate bankruptcy charter was called the We the People document. Many know it today as the Constitution. If you are careful to read the grievances of the Declaration of Independence and then read the writing of the Constitution, you will see how it was a power grab. It was not a fight for independent freedom since the very grievances in the Declaration of War were rights given to the government over the American people. We the people did not stand for people who live on the land, but rather sovereign wealthy constitutors of the contract. Those who sign the Constitution are the only ones who are party to it. This is basic contract law and has been upheld by the Supreme Federal Courts. Those who oversaw the implementation of the bankruptcy were called constitutors and still are known as this today. They pledged the states and the land that they held as collateral for the debt to the banks that financed the revolution. 
The We the People group of wealthy Americans protected themselves and their wealth by pledging the land that they and all other Americans live on. What is essential for everyone to understand is that this is a hybrid corporation. It uses trust law to make business with corporate fictions, the military-industrial complex, and international banks. The beneficiaries of this trust are every single worker, boss, and Anglo-Saxon commercial fiction doing business in this corporate trust. When the bankruptcy was finishing up leading up to the War of 1812, the corporation, reorganized by President Jackson, this created an unlikely byproduct, a new term called a free man. People were now, for the first time in all of history, free of debt. Needing a way to continue collection, the King's corporations and the factions within the American corporate structure sought a new way to leech the American plantation workers and return them to serfdom. So after a hundred years of weak central corporate structure, the Civil War came about to unite the states or corporations, trusts, and commonwealths into a one unified corporation. All power would be centralized with one authoritarian central corporate structure. Unintended consequences of the Civil War was the liberty of the slaves. The corporate plantations of America, of which many in the North began to industrialize, sought a new way to enslave men on their plantations. The 14th Amendment to the original bankruptcy compact was passed after a new constitution was accepted by the king after the Civil War. In order for the corporate fiction overlords to be able to do business in admiralty contract law, the corporation can only do business with other fictional corporations. So they came up with a genius plan to make free men, which were unpleasant byproducts of the original bankruptcy compact, enter into contracting agreements with the corporation. In order for this to happen, there had to be a crisis. 1929, the stock market crashed. As the dire financial circumstances of the corporation became clear, it went to bankruptcy again, where they pledged as collateral for the debt, since all the wealth and land was already pledged, all futures of energy that will one day be produced by the plantations and its slaves could be traded as debt instead of real money. The bankers, corporate overseers, and profiteers designed a new trust program where every single human would be entered into a corporate military industrial complex through the social security system. This system is the basic structure of how the world government will implement control over the world plantation. Since 1933, when born, parents are asked to sign a birth certificate pledging ownership and creating a corporate fiction for the new labor worker, now known as a 14th Amendment citizen, entering the slave plantation. Before the baby can touch land, their foot is stamped on a certificate making them surety for the debt. First, the certificate is recorded at the county recorder. Then they send it to the Secretary of State, which sends it to the Borough of Census of the Commerce Department. This allows the child to now become an instrument of debt for the corporation, technically a trust instrument of a 14th Amendment freed slave. This certificate is valued around $1 million and is circulated through the market as collateral for debt on loans. This person becomes a fictional persona in commerce. This position requires that once this corporate fiction becomes matured in the market, it would have to sign a new contract with the corporate trust pledging to hold a post within the military industrial corporation. This is what the actual purpose of the selective service is. Every 14th Amendment citizen is holding a post within the military. If you do not believe this, please look up USA Government and U.S. Army Duns and Bradstreet Numbers. Notice the amount of employees are exactly the same. In order for the color of law contract to be viable and hold ground, the parents have to acknowledge the baby came through a birth canal and requires a birth certificate to dock, 
with the corporation and do business. The parents have three days under the Truth in Lending Act to rescind their signatures and the mother is named with her maiden name to ensure the child is considered a bastard child. Once a bastard child, they lose all rights to the corporation. Think about it. A birth is when a ship docks to do commerce. A birth canal is where the ship passes to the dock. And a birth certificate happens to be the paperwork filed when a merchant is claiming the product stored on a ship. The product of the ship is all future energy produced in commerce. Now these corporations, townships, and fascist governments have more employees working for them than within the free market. Essentially, there has never been a free market. This is why the corporate overlords always blame the free market because they are referring to the industrialized militarism they have installed in America and around the world for hundreds of years. All government workers are given pensions, which Wall Street and the banks invest into major corporations such as Walmart, Kmart, GM, and GE, plus many others. These corporations are too big to fail because the banks invest the future retirement of pensions of all government workers into these companies. This is why, no matter what, some of these corporations just don't fail. They have investors within their company who don't even know what they are investing in. These employees and beneficiaries of the trust corporation know they are guaranteed a retirement or a future benefit from their corporate overlords. What should happen if the future is erased? Or like the fictions that operate under color of law, they are realized for being fake and make-believe. The biggest thing for people to realize is that the New World Order is not something new. This has been an experiment of control of energy and productivity of slaves on a big plantation called the United States of America. There was a plan from the beginning to make the whole world a plantation. Now that the third bankruptcy is over, the military-industrial plantation of America has merged with other corporations to install governments or corporate fictional overlords in each and every plantation on earth. They are creating one big plantation, one which none of us can escape. So please, before you argue any more, do some research. Here's the door. Open it if you like. Welcome, my friends, to The Big Plantation.